Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this message. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to stay up to date with all of our great content. Thanks again for checking out this message. We pray it is a blessing to you. So today's the day. Today is the day when we finish the Roman series. A series that we started 30 some odd weeks ago. Um, and I'm really excited about it and I'm kind of bummed because I've thoroughly enjoyed preaching through the book of Romans. And if I, I can just be honest for a moment, um, considering preaching through the book of Romans is a bit, a bit intimidating. Um, but now being on the back end and having this be the last message of the book of Romans um, for this series, at least, I'm so glad we did it. I'm so glad that we've worked through it. It's been rich. I think it's in, in, enriched us as a church and as individuals. Um, Greg gave me a great encouraging word as I walked up here. He said, hey, man, it's been a great series. Don't mess this last one up. <laughs> and that's what friends are for. My beloved Greg. <laughs> So this is what I want to do, is I want to just remind us um, what Paul's been talking about in this letter to the church in Rome the whole way through. And really, it's something we live by as Christians. Uh, once we've put our faith in Jesus, what the Bible is all about is what the book of Romans is all about. And so if you're writing uh, notes down, here's the message. It's titled for today. It's all about Jesus from beginning to end. What Paul does is pretty awesome. He's a great writer. Um, English wasn't my strongest subject in school. Um, I don't remember writing very many papers. Some of you think because uh, I, I think God's blessed me with the gift to be able to preach, um, you think that translates maybe I'd be able to write well. It doesn't. And so if you send me um, paragraphs to respond to, you'll get a sentence or a brief statement or a thumbs up. But what Paul does do, and what I do remember from those classes, is Paul starts with a statement to kind of let us know what he's getting into, the strength of his argument, and then he'll end with the same statement just to wrap it all up. And I want to show that to you. I want to remind you what he said at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, and then I want to read to you the text for today at the end of chapter 16. And so let's start with Romans 1, 1 through 5. It says this, Paul... He's introducing himself, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. That's the good news of God. And we'll see that the good news of God is Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the gospel. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the nations, that's what Gentiles means, all the nations or the peoples to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. Now, this is awesome. It ends with, through him, we received grace. We were saved. We were called to go call others, all the peoples, all the nations, to, to obedience that comes from faith. Now, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone that we are saved. But what we see in Scripture is that faith is never found alone. It is not by our works so that we could boast. It is by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. But all through the text, there is no way to, to, to separate the fact that faith is supposed to drive us to action. It's it quiet when you say those kind of things. He says that to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith. So you're calling them to faith that drives obedience for whose namesake? Not for their own namesake, not for their nation's namesake, for their people's namesake, for their, their tribe's namesake, but for the sake of God's name. 
that all of it is unto his glory, that we have been called, we have been saved through our faith in the good news of Jesus Christ as Lord, and that we have been appointed to go proclaim that good news to the nations, that they would also come into obedience of the faith, all not so we could, we could pat ourselves on the back for doing God's work, not so that we could be uh, the one that receives praise for our salvation, but that we would glorify God. Paul starts Romans this way. And then look, let's look at the three verses at the end of Romans 16 that we're going to spend our time in today. He says this to sum up the letter. We just saw the way he started it. Let's see how he sums it up. He uses the same kind of verbiage. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. I love what he does here. Paul has spent... 16 chapters, and, and they weren't broken up in chapters at the time. It's just one long letter, and it's a long letter. If you attempt to just read through it all in one sitting, it'll take you a little while, and your brain somewhere around, I don't know, chapter three or four will start to bog down. But what we see is Paul is saying, listen, it's been a common theme all throughout this whole letter. Jesus Christ is the one who saves. He saves us to a life of obedience that comes from faith all to the glory of God. And that we would go proclaim that same message to the world at large, the peoples, the nations, so that they would also come to an obedience that is by faith so that God would be, receive most glory. He's interested in God being praised as he should be knowing that God is praised best when his kingdom grows in us and through us in the world at large. And so he he wraps all of it up in this nice little bow that it's all about Jesus from beginning to end. And that everything between this is just to explain it. It's just to help us understand the mystery that, that has been revealed, the prophecy that has been fulfilled, that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm not going to get into all the words that are in between these two statements, all of those chapters, because I've done that for 30-something weeks. And so if you want that, which I think is beneficial, if this is the first time you're here today and you're coming in the last three verses of Romans, um, I encourage you to, to go back and absorb the rest of the teachings of Romans and read Romans for yourself. It is rich, and it is beautiful, and it is helpful for our walk with God. And so today, again, it's, it's all about Jesus from beginning to end. And if you're <clears throat> taking notes, the first point I want to look at is able to make stable, or that God has the ability to bring stability. I don't know if you heard that. I started with, <clears throat> excuse me, now to him who is able to establish you. And we'll see at the end, in in verse 27, it says, the only wise God. It starts with, now to him, and and, and to to who? The only wise God. The one who should should get glory for all of this. For the one in whom it's for his name's sake. To him who is able to establish you. That's good news. To him. The only wise God the Lord of lords and King of kings, to him who is able to. And the word able to is powerful to. In fact, the the word in the original language for um, is able to is actually the same word where we get the word dynamite from. It's that kind of powerful. He has the power to establish. He has the capacity, the ability to establish you, and to establish you is to to strengthen, to make firm, to bring, to make stable. I don't know if you're hearing this. To make stable, to make firm, 
to establish that God has the, the power. He's the one that we praise because he's the one that is able to save us and stabilize us, to save us and make us firm, to establish us, that we would be rooted, that we would be safe in his hands, that nothing could take us away from that, that our dependence is fully on him to save us and establish us, to sanctify us, to strengthen us, to stabilize us. Look at this in, in Jude 24 and 25. When we see at the end of Romans here, what we see at the end of Jude is this, this benediction or this blessing. In Jude 24 and 25, it says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. That God saves you unto himself and has the ability to prepare you to stand before him on that day that he reconciles you into right relationship and that he purifies you, perfects you to look more like Christ so that you are prepared for that day and he's able to keep you from stumbling Hmm. and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Here's the deal. Many of us believe that he's able to save us, but then we try in our own strength to not stumble. In Philippians, it says that our confidence is in the fact that the one that started a work in us will complete it. He's the one we depend on. He's the one who's able. He's the one who has the strength to be able to make us stable and strong and secure and firm in him to look more like Christ. To the only God, our Savior, be glory. The only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. He's able to make stable. And you know that in in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about building our life on, on a firm Foundation. He brings stability to us, and many of us know what it's like to be unstable. In talking about building our life on Him, on the rock, that verse in the Sermon on the Mount says that that storms come. In fact, it gives examples of those that build on sand or those build on the rock, and it says, when the storms come, when the water rises, when it comes down, there's wind. And the understanding is that regardless of what you build on, storms come. But there's one way to make you stable, and there's other ways that keep you unstable. And that God has the ability to stabilize you as we cling to him, as we build our lives on him, following after him, obeying his commands. And he's able to establish He is able. Romans 8, 35 through 39, I love this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is able. He is strong enough to keep you. That should give you peace and the ability to rest that it is not based on your own strength. It is not based on your own wisdom. It is based on you being found in him. And he is able to keep you, establish you, strengthen you, stabilize you, sanctify you to look more like Jesus. He is able where we are not. Able to make stable. And listen, Paul goes on to say how he makes us stable. He says, according to my gospel, My gospel, he has some ownership of the gospel. And there's a reason he does, we'll look at it in just a minute, but he says, to establish you in accordance 
with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ. Now, this is great because when he says in accordance with my gospel, in fact, some translations don't say the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ. It just straight up says the proclamation about Jesus Christ. That's what his gospel is. How simple is that? In accordance with my gospel. What's your gospel, Paul? The proclamation about Jesus Christ. I just tell him about Jesus. And that, in accordance with that, God has the ability to establish you according to the gospel, that he saves you by the power of the gospel, that he stabilizes you and strengthens you by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul, in, in Galatians, and talking about my gospel, in Galatians 1, 11 through 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not from, of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul says, this isn't something just a tradition passed on. Jesus Christ revealed himself to me and gave me this gospel about himself to share with you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he will remind the church in Corinth of what that gospel is, this gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And he'll say that it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. This is so good. Here's my gospel. This is what I preached to you. It's the gospel I got from Jesus. It is the truth. You've received it, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. He says, there's one gospel, one good news. There's one way to be saved, and his name is Jesus Christ. And it's putting your faith in him as Lord. And you must cling to that. Don't, don't go astray. Don't go some other direction. We repent of all other ways, and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance. And now he'll explain the, his gospel that he preaches, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then the 12th. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. They're dead. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul just wants to remind, listen, don't forget, God deserves all the glory. He's the only wise God. He made the perfect way for us to be right with him. He establishes you by my gospel, and his gospel is this, Jesus Christ as Lord. That is, Jesus is the only way that he died, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, all according to scripture, and he says it's verifiable. In fact, if you want to know about it, go talk to my guys. They saw him raised. If you don't want to just believe me, in fact, you're supposed to believe anything on a court of two or three witnesses. He's like, there's like 500 guys. Some have fallen asleep, but the rest of them, go, 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 go call on them as a witness. Jesus Christ is Lord. And so Paul is reminding them at the end of Romans, the same thing he told them at the beginning, that Jesus Christ is the only way from beginning to end. He's able to stabilize us. He reminds them of what his gospel is, the proclamation about Jesus Christ. And then he says that Jesus is the mystery revealed and the prophecy fulfilled. And so watch this, the mystery revealed. The message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation, the revealed truth of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed. He's already walked through some of this in the book of Romans that he says that, listen, this isn't something new, but you just didn't see it before. That the Savior for Israel is the Savior of the world. He's not just the Lord of Israel or the King of Israel. He's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the only way to be right with our Father in heaven. For all people, the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. There's one name. And so he says that this, this mystery has been revealed. And I love what he says in Colossians. 
2, 2 and 3. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Hmm. Many people, even knowing the scripture, didn't even see their Savior when he stood before them. That it's a mystery that must be revealed. Without God revealing to you that Jesus Christ is Lord, it, it, the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. But for those that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. And so he says that my hope and my goal is that they would know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In fact, just before this in Colossians, in Colossians 1, it says, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles or the nations, that's everybody that's not Israel, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That there is this, the, the, the whole world needs to know there is a savior. His name is Jesus. And this mystery that needs to be revealed is only hidden until it's revealed by God to us. It's not that God is, is, is keeping it away from all, but that he's revealing it through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the mystery has been revealed in Jesus. And so Paul's landing this thing by saying, God deserves all of our praise, the one who is able to establish you, make you firm, make you strong in him in accordance with the gospel that is the proclamation of Jesus Christ, the one that was the mystery that has now been revealed. And we'll go on and say he is the prophecy that has been fulfilled. Hmm. I don't feel like you have the energy that I have this morning. That's all right. I got enough for all of us. <laughs> He's the prophecy fulfilled. Look, and made known or made manifest through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God. He says... It is a mystery revealed, hidden and now revealed, but it's not something that wasn't always there. It's been in the prophetic writings all the way throughout. He was prophesied about. It all points to Jesus. Just like Romans is about Jesus from beginning to the end, the Bible is about Jesus from beginning to the end. For the believer, all those that put their faith in Jesus, our lives are to be about him from beginning to the end on a large level and daily, moment to moment, about him. In Luke 24, 27, I love this. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He's walking with these two men that don't realize it's him. And it says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the whole Old Testament, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That Jesus is able to say, this is all about me. I'll show you. It's all about Jesus. And our lives should be also. When I think through that, it, it, it's a bit convicting because it's really easy for any and all of us to categorize our life and have all the sections we feel safe about be about Jesus. All the categories we sit, feel comfortable about be all about Jesus. And kind of close the door on some areas of our life and be like, no, nah, don't talk to me about that. No, nah, leave that out. No, I, I want to be the king of that part. I want to be the Lord of that part. I don't want that part of me to have to submit to the kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ, because that would confront my flesh. That would confront my sin nature. He is the prophecy fulfilled that all of the Bible points to Jesus. So again, he's able to make stable by the gospel. He is the mystery revealed, the prophecy fulfilled. And I love this. Jesus is for everybody. Say, Jesus is, for everybody. Jesus is for everybody. How arrogant is it of us to, at any point, think that we shouldn't bring the gospel to all people? I don't know if you heard me. 
that we would judge who we think deserves to hear the good news, the only saving way, Jesus Christ. And I know we wouldn't say that we do that, but our actions would probably say that we do. Even when we get bold enough and courageous enough to go and evangelize, I'll bet we stay in comfortable spaces. So we get out of the comfort of just the holy huddle to say, I'm going to go tell somebody that doesn't know about Jesus about Jesus, but even then, let me stay in my comfort. Watch out. Watch out, because you might be judging in your heart who you think is deserving of the gospel. I'm not saying that you are, but you might be. If it's hard for you to consider taking the gospel to the most broken, the most hurting, or the most offensive, the most wicked, then you might have too high of a view of, of yourself when it comes to your salvation. You need Jesus just as much as those that you think are the most wicked. Not any less than. And so do I. Jesus is for everybody. Look at this. So that all the Gentiles, and sometimes when we read Gentiles, I think we can get caught up and forget that it literally means the nations, the peoples, the people groups, that all the peoples, all the nations might come to the obedience that comes from faith. This is great. He says, this gospel can establish you. It is the gospel that is Jesus Christ is Lord. And that gospel, in that gospel, when we see Jesus Christ, we understand he is Lord. He is the mystery that has been revealed. He is the prophecy that has been fulfilled. And we are to proclaim that truth, that good news to all people, all people, in hopes that it would bring obedience that comes from faith. And we'll see in a moment, so that God would receive more glory, that he would get more worship, that he would get more praise, not just through us individually, although that should be the case as he is sanctifying us to look more like Jesus, but at large, as the, the, the believers grow, as the church grows. And I don't mean like the church is, is specifically in like attendance, but I mean believers. As people put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, He receives more praise on this earth, and he is worthy of all of it. He is deserving of all of it, all of it, for his name's sake, for his glory, for his praise. We are called to all peoples to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in hopes that it would bring, the goal would be to bring people into obedience that comes from faith. to Jew and to Gentile, to all people. I love in Romans 10, 11 through 13, it says, as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over or, or Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise the Lord that we have been called to be ambassadors, to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the world, to the, to the furthest extents, to the depths of our own community, to the extents of the world at large. Hmm. How we doing? How we doing? He has called us unto himself into a right relationship with him and put us on his mission to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and hopes that God would work through that in a powerful way to draw people to himself when they see his great love for them found in Christ. That's how you were saved? That's how you were saved. Someone proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ to you. 
And God worked through that in a powerful way. By his spirit, he transformed your heart. He opened your eyes, took the scales away, opened your ears that you could hear and understand. You could see and grasp and walk into a relationship with God in all of its fullness. That the mystery that was hidden was now revealed. That the prophecy was fulfilled. That you now richly enjoy a right relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And you are not called to keep that to yourself. I'm going to preach myself tired this morning. (laughs) All glory to God. Look at this last part of verse 27. To the only wise God. I love that. There's no other wise God. The one who all in his wisdom made a perfect plan. Out of his love and the abundance of his perfect, right relationship with himself as a triune God, he made mankind to be in right relationship with him. Man rebelled against God, sinned against the holy, righteous God, turned their backs on God, shook their fist at God. And if that sounds like too much, so did you. And that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that all of us, have stacked up wrath for ourselves in the day of judgment. But God, out of his great love for us, has made a way for us to be back in right relationship with him. That Jesus Christ would receive the wrath, do us for our sins on himself, extend to us his righteousness, that we would be forgiven. That we would have peace and have joy and have stability and be established in his power because he is able to do so. And that we would have great confidence and we would be excited to see the return of our king, not with dread or in fear, but with joy and excitement to finally behold the one who has saved us. What a day. That God made this plan and to only, the only wise God be glory, be praise forever, through Jesus Christ, exclamation point. He wants to make a clear point here. You praise something. There's only one that is wise, that is God, that deserves all of our praise, all of the glory, forever. And that is done through Jesus Christ. Amen. All in God's power, and all to God's glory, all of it. I want to just land Romans, and specifically the text today, seeing that it's all in God's power and all to his glory, that he saves us in his power, that he strengthens us by his power, that he sends us in his power, and that all of it is to his glory. Saved by God's power through the gospel of Jesus. Paul started in Romans 1 with these powerful two verses. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Man. I pray that we're not ashamed of the gospel. In a, in a time where In the culture, it seems wrong to have definitive, objective truth. And it makes for a time that it's easy to kind of shy away or, or turn back, especially in, in, a, in, in a day and time where loud voices will try to cancel you out If you stand out, or if you speak against some mainstream ideas, we are not called to be ashamed. Let us be as courageous as Paul, 
who is ready to not only be thrown in prison, but to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now listen, we don't live in a place or a time where that's our reality. And we're still ashamed. Isn't that crazy? Sometimes I wonder, and this isn't to beat us up as a church. I feel like my message is coming across like I'm beating us up as a church. That's not my goal. I have, I, I, I'm deeply convicted. I wonder if we stood before the early church who was actually under heavy persecution or if we stood before some of our brothers and sisters in Christ that are around the world with real persecution. Would our faith be laughable? As they will stand for Christ even if they're killed. And that often we're afraid of what could happen in a cubicle. And I get the realities of how it can impact our lives if we decide to actually stand for the good news of Jesus Christ. And I fully understand that it's easy to discredit me because literally I'm a pastor, so nothing happens with my career if I go declare Jesus Christ. In fact, it makes me better at my job. (laughs) And I still would be amiss as your pastor to not tell you that you should stand for the gospel, even if it costs you everything. And then we would need to depend on each other and rely on each other as we felt real hard time, saying that there is one way to be right with God, and his name is Jesus Christ. The God-man Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. We're saved by God's power through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith, that is by faith, believing for all those that believe. Romans ten seventeen says this, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Like this will mess with you if you really consider the fact that you believe that God really is who he says he is, that the Bible is the authority for Christian belief and practice, that there is really heaven and hell and judgment before God. Now think about that and think about it not just for yourself, but think about it for everyone you know. And if we really believe that that is a reality, that that is truth, and that we need a savior and that his name is Jesus, and that people apart from Christ will receive the wrath due their sins on themselves with an eternity of judgment that should wreck us to the place of not being ashamed of how, you, how, how someone might judge me, but caring more about their salvation and their I- I- eternal judgment than my temporary judgment by man. And the way that people come to faith is from the hearing of the message. So how do they hear the message if it's not the believers that proclaim it? If it's not those that have the word that take the word, who else is going to bring the word to those that need to hear the message of Jesus Christ so they would have faith in him and be saved? If it's not those that have possession of that great good news, we have a a responsibility. And it's a great one. And it's a glorious one, and it is a high calling, and it is beautiful, and it is daunting, and it can only be done by his spirit in us, giving us the courage, giving us the strength, giving us the words to say. It is by his power we are saved. We are strengthened by God's power also. We see that in the text today. 
He's the one that establishes us. We saw it in Jude 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. We rely on him. We're saved by his great power through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are strengthened, made stable, sanctified through God's great power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are sent. Hmm. We are sent in God's power with the gospel of Jesus. You've probably heard this before if you've been in church for more than a little while. Most often it's called the Great Commission. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, listen to this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says, I have authority over everything. All authority over heaven and earth, over everything has been given to me. And out of that place of authority, he looks to his disciples and to all of us now that would follow him and put faith in him and says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, which kind of goes back to what Paul was saying, the obedience that comes from faith, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How comforting is that, that Jesus, who has all authority to, to give us our mission, does so with that authority and then says, and don't stress about it, I'm going with you for this job. The, the, he, God's the one that establishes us. He's the one that saves us, that strengthens us, and that sends us in his power with the gospel to proclaim to the world. In Acts 1 and verse 8, Jesus, after the resurrection, right before ascending into heaven, says to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses that's just a, that's a definitive statement. He doesn't say, and if you get a chance, if you could maybe potentially, if you can find it in your schedule, if the opportunity arises, be my witness. He says, you will do this. The Holy Spirit will come on you and you will, the, the power of God will be in you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I need the worship team to come up. That it is by God's power and it is to God's glory. We take no credit in our salvation. We take no credit in our sanctification to be made more like Christ. We receive the gospel. We cling to God. We strive with all the strength he has given us to look more like Christ, to live out what he's called us to do, and he gets all the credit. All of our confidence is in him because he's, he's the one that saves. He's the one that establishes, he's, and he's able to do it. Whenever you're feeling like, ah, I don't know. I don't feel very stable. I don't feel very strong. I don't know if I can make it. Here's the deal. You can't in your strength. You're not able, but you rely on the one who is. And anytime we think we're not going to make it, remember who's the one that gives the promise. He is able. He is able. He is stronger than anything that comes against you. Rely on him. Depend on him. Turn to him. Cling to him. Hold on to him. Walk in him. Be in his presence. Be found in his word. Strengthened by his spirit. You have been saved by the power of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are strengthened and stabilized, sanctified through the power of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are sent in the power of God to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world at large. We have a mission. And it's one that we can't just pass on. And it's all to his glory. It's not, we don't go do this mission so that we can go like, man, look how good the roots is doing. 
or look how good fill in your name there is doing. Aren't I doing great? No, the reason we do it is so that our God, whom we love and we are grateful that he has saved us, I am am interested, God, that you would be glorified. God, I am interested that you would be praised. God, let everything I do point to you. And let me help point everybody else also to you. And the only way for us to be good with you, right with you, to walk this out with you is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's all to his glory. It's all for his name's sake. Love these verses in Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, now to him who is able, against that same kind of statement, who is able to, it's this, this power, who, him who has the power to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I love that statement. Immeasurably beyond measure. More than we can ask or imagine. Here's the thing about asking or imagining. Right when you think you hit the limit, I could say, imagine more, and you could do it. Like once you've, you're done asking, you could ask again. So to think about the length of how, how we ask and imagine, and then to think, oh man, that already by itself seems massive. Now think of more than that. Wow, that's even bigger. Now think of immeasurably more. He's up to things in our lives that we know nothing about. He has the capacity and ability to go so far beyond what we're even imagining he's up to in the saving and sanctifying and sending of his people. When when you're working through some things, as you're being sanctified, as you're still working through some sin issues or struggling through some things, you need to remember because sometimes you can feel beat up. You can feel like you're never going to be able to get through something. And you need to remember that it's not your strength we're dependent on. You're not dependent on my strength, your strength, the person next to you's strength. It is God who is able to do more than you can even ask for as he saves and sanctifies, sets us apart for his good work and all to his glory. Watch what he do, does through a submitted people. Watch, watch what he does when we go, God, we believe you for who you say you are. We believe that we're called to do what you say we're called to do. We believe that you're able to do everything that you promise. And we're going to walk that out, even if it's scary, even if it's going to take some courage and some boldness to really live life together, sharpen each other, walk these things out, give, care, love, share the good news, to do all these things. God, it it can be difficult, it can be messy, but you're able, you are able, you are able, and we depend on you in all of it. And when we mess it up, you're able to fix it. Praise God. According to his power, this is great, who is able, he has the power, according to his power, that is at work within us. His power is in us. To him, Be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We are a people that praise. In fact, I would say that because mankind is made to praise, all people praise. It's true. All people worship. Everybody bows down to certain things. Everybody cheers for certain things. But we have the unique viewpoint and understanding of where all praise is supposed to land. That all of our life should be a praise unto his name. That all of our life should bow down before his throne. Not to the ways of this world, not to the ways of culture, not to the ways of our own flesh our sinful nature, but we submit our lives before the king, the one who is able. Some of us in this room today just need to remember he's able. You're struggling with something. Remember, he's able. He is able. He is able 
to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. Hmm. That we should give him glory and we should give him praise. Could you stand to your feet?